Amen. Let the king trust in you. Father, we come tonight to worship you, to give you all that we are, God. Lord, to lay ourselves down, God, for you. Lord, let our lives be a sacrifice of praise tonight to you. And Lord, we just want to lift up the name of Jesus and glorify him in this house. In Jesus' name, thank you, Father. Give myself away Give myself away So you can use me Give myself away Give myself 
give myself away. Give myself away so you can use me. Lord, that's our prayer tonight. Lord, we give ourselves away. God, that you could use us. Father, we love you. Father, we thank you. Lord, we exalt the name of Jesus in this place tonight. Lord, you are the king of our hearts. And Lord, we lay our lives down before you tonight as living sacrifices, honoring you, God, with the lives that we live. Father, we ask tonight, God, Lord, as we move into our time of the word and prayer, that, Lord, your presence would go with us. Lord, fill every home that is watching tonight. Father, wherever they're watching around the world, throughout this community, Lord, I'm praying that hearts would be transformed and blessed tonight by your presence. Father, we thank you, God, for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, you all can get comfortable while we're getting comfortable this evening. So appreciate you guys bearing with us as we're navigating some of our uh, uh, technical difficulties tonight. But we serve an awesome God, amen? amen? Now you get to look at my beautiful wife. She's not just manning the camera, but she is able to be seated out with us this evening. Not, She's gonna. I'm not on Facebook. I'm watching for comments. She's watching for comments. So, you know, feel free if you do have comments tonight or questions tonight as we're going through the teaching. We invite you to, to be a part of tonight. Really, it's interactive. Our Wednesday night services are much like this anyway in the sanctuary. Uh, we open it up for questions and comments throughout the evening as we're, as we're teaching. So, uh, so we just kind of invite you into our home and invite you into this series. We're in a series called Prison Letters. Uh, about the, the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote while he was in prison. And he wrote several, but the one that we're focusing on the last several weeks is, is the book of Philippians. And tonight's teaching is, this is the title of tonight's teaching, is Division Keeps Us From Fulfilling God's Purpose. Right. And so we're going to read Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. I'm reading in the New Living Translation if you want to follow along. But it says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. I love you and long to see you, dear friends, for you are my joy and the crown I receive from my work. Now I appeal to Udia and Sintich, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone that you that, let's see that you are considerate in all you do. And then this, remember the Lord is coming soon. Right. You know, as we continue in our prison letter series tonight we want to look at an admonition that paul gives to two people who are apparently not getting along so you don't have to be in church very long before you see this happen people don't get along in church <laughs> and so the apostle paul is addressing this word had gotten back to him that these two women Judea and sintich both believers and obviously faithful in their service to god had had some kind of falling out. Uh, it's not told to us what had happened between the two of them, but they were not getting along. It was creating some disunity, some division in the body, and it gets back to Paul. And so Paul, it's, it's obviously distressed him enough that he includes this admonition in the letter he writes back to the church. Right. He appeals to them and to the church to help them settle their disagreement. The reason is, is that the ramifications of such division on a local body can be devastating. And it really gave me to thinking that there were two things that Paul mentioned about these women. One was that they were, they were telling others about the good news. And so Paul knew this. If these two women were actively telling others about Christ, 
And now as a pair or as a duo or for whatever reason, they're not working together. The thing that's suffering is evangelism. The evangelism in the church was being affected. But it was also, it was also affecting the productivity. Right. Productivity was being diminished within the body of Christ. So it says, it says of them that they worked alongside Clement and they were working alongside the church people. They had some kind of falling out. So we know this, that the evangelism in the church was effective. The productivity of the church was also affected. We've been asked, you know, we have been given a task as the body of Christ to reconcile people. Right. Did you know that? That's a, one of the missions of the body of Christ is to reconcile people. Yes, we're supposed to recognize unbelievers to God, but also believers with one another. And here is a statement that, that I want you to think about. We cheapen reconciliation when we see people reconciled to God only to come into the church and see people at odds with each other. Right. Let me say it again. We cheapen the ministry of reconciliation when we go through the hard work of seeing reconciling unbelievers to God only to bring them into the body of Christ and then to see that we can't even be reconciled to each other right. inside the church. We do such a disservice to that ministry. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20, it says, And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ, and God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin that we could be made right with God through Christ. We have this amazing ministry that God has given us to bring people from darkness to light, to share the gospel, to see them reconciled, unbelievers reconciled to God, to see their entire lives transformed. And yet, we can't seem to figure out how to reconcile with each other when we have a disagreement within right. the body of Christ. Yeah. And I think that that's, it throws people for a loop right. when they come into church after being saved and they've been miraculously reconciled with God only to see that the same people who witnessed to them cannot seem to forgive or get past the hurt somebody else had committed against them right there in the pew that they're sitting in. Right. And so he tells us in Matthew, Jesus gives us a couple of ways. What do we do when we have been sinned against? What do we do when we know we've sinned against somebody else? And the Bible is not silent on this. In fact, right. Jesus teaches in here what we are to do if, if somebody sins against us, right? And in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17, it says, if another believer sins against you. Notice what it said. If another believer sins against you. Not another unbeliever, but another believer sins against you. Here's what it says. Number one, go privately. If you're at home, type privately into your comments. Go privately and point out the offense. Right. When somebody offends you, another believer offends you in the church and the body of Christ. It is not, Facebook is not the place that you go to bemoan the fact that you've been injured. You do not go to your prayer chain at your church and, and try to cover it up under the guise of prayer as you begin to tell on this person for what they did and how you need prayer in that situation. No, your first response to being sinned against by somebody, another believer, is to go to them privately and talk about what had happened. Right. That's not easy to do. In fact, some people are like, I just couldn't do it. I would rather just be offended. But that is not how we reconcile. We don't reconcile by ignoring the hurt. We reconcile by addressing what happened. But we don't have to do it in a public setting unless, and it goes on to tell us this, it says, 
If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won the person back. But if you're unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. So maybe you go and you try to reconcile and that person either will not admit that they hurt you or will not take responsibility for hurting you. And so it says in this situation, take a couple people back with you, have this conversation again. So now there's witnesses to the conversation. Right. I think it needs to be noted in that kind of situation, if you take witnesses with you, that you take witnesses that are... Um, Not immediately going to take your side in the matter. Right. That they're, they're, unbiased. Totally, they're, they're totally neutral in the right. situation. Because it's easy to find people that are going to say, oh yeah, that you know they're going to take your side or they're going to back you up. But they need you need to take people that are going to be neutral and are going to see both sides of the situation and can speak wisdom into that situation. Yeah. In verse 17 it says, if the person still refuses to listen, then take your case to the church. And then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, right? If, if you know they've sinned, if you've taken witnesses and they confirm that they've sinned, but they're still unrepentant, and then you take it before the church, and even the church agrees that they have sinned, but they refuse to accept the decision, then it says that we are to treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. But you know, most of the time somebody hurts us, we just move to treat the person as a pagan. We don't even try to go through the alternate steps that it said. Right. You know, the ultimate goal here is reconciliation. It's to be restored to that person. It's not to prove yourself right. Right. It's not to, I'm going to go and I'm going to prove to them I'm right by taking these witnesses. No, the goal is I want to be reconciled to you. I want to be back in right relationship with you. But it can't happen until you recognize that you've hurt me. Right. And I think that it's important for us to evaluate our own heart. Yeah. You know, before we even go to that person individually, you know, is, is, my, is my goal in this not to be made right, not for this person to apologize, not for this person to say I was wrong, but it's my heart in this to be reconciled to this person because I don't want to, to be the person that is hindering the ministry, hindering my witness or whatever, you know, that we need to check our own heart and make sure that our heart is toward reconciliation of that relationship as well. Yeah. Sometimes it's not other people that have hurt us, it's us have heard of the people. Right. And this is also addressed in Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 through 25. It says, So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. Isn't that interesting? Is that God says, you can be in the middle of worshiping me. And if in the middle of worshiping me, you realize that, that somebody has ought against you and, you. and you know they do. He said, stop worshiping me. Stop presenting your sacrifice. Go and reconcile. That's how important this is. That if you know you've hurt somebody, that you go reconcile with that person. God said, you know, we think about this. How many times are we like, well, you know, they'll get past it. You know, I don't believe God can receive your offering." can receive your worship if you're knowingly hurt people and refuse to go back and take responsibility right. for what you've done to them. It says in verse 25, it says, when you are on your way to court with your adversary, it says, settle your differences quickly. Mm -hmm. It says, otherwise your accuser may hand you over to the judge and who will hand you over to an officer and you will be thrown into prison. Throughout we're going to see in just a little bit throughout the entire New Testament, Paul is continually telling people we need to live in unity. We need to settle our differences. And they give us some, some prime examples throughout this passage of Scripture that we have a responsibility to do that. We have a responsibility as the body of Christ to help people be reconciled. When we know as mature believers, Galatians 6.1 says this. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. 
You see, we have a ministry of reconciliation, not just reconciling unbelievers to God, but reconciling believers who have disagreements. And as a believer, I have the responsibility that if someone has sinned against me, that I need to go to them. But also, if I have sinned against somebody else, I need to go to them. Right. But then also, if we recognize that as a body that people are not getting along, that we need to step in humbly and gently and do our best to try to help them to, to come to a, a conclusion of this. Right. And I think it's important for us to recognize that, you know, What's being inferred there in both situations is that we're accountable for how we respond right. to that. How we respond whenever the Lord convicts us and convicts us of the need to go to somebody and repent yeah. whenever we've offended them. But he also holds us accountable for when somebody has offended us to go to that person with a heart to reconcile that relationship and bring restoration in that relationship as well and not to put it off and say well you know Scott didn't come to me and say that he was sorry so you know he's just gonna have I'm just gonna wait until he does that right. the Lord says that you know we're accountable for what we do with the word right. and that's that that's he gives me clear instructions on what to do and so I need to rightly divide and rightly handle the word of God in that situation yeah because yeah, in both those situations it says if someone has sinned against you you go to them and if you remember that You've hurt somebody, you go to them. It deals with you <laughs> in both of those. Not with the other person, but with you. When you know this has happened, you need to do the work of reconciling that relationship. Right. Colossians 3.13, it says, Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. As I read that, I just wrote these three things. Make allowances. Yeah. Listen, you're going to make mistakes. Yeah. You need to make allowances for other people to make mistakes as well who are around you. Right. You need to forgive quickly those who have made the mistakes. At the same, with the same type of forgiveness that Jesus forgave you, you need to forgive others. Right. And then the last one is remember your own failings. Mm -hmm. I think that if we will just take a moment, instead of focusing so intently on what somebody else did, if we'll take a minute to think about the things that we have done and how we would have wanted someone to respond to us in grace right. and mercy yeah. as well. Because the disunity, and this is what Paul was really beginning to think, was really trying to address. Disunity promotes division. Right. Right? These, they, these individuals were once united with a common purpose, right? Both these women were, were fierce advocates of the gospel. They were sharing the good news with people. They also worked as one with the body of Christ. So they, they understood unity. They were unified at one time. Unity is a common theme among the early church writers. And I'm just going to share just a few very quickly tonight. Uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, in virtually every letter that he wrote, he talks about unity. Mm -hmm. Just about every single letter. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, he says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Can you imagine a church with no divisions? Can you imagine a church that, that, that people lived in harmony with each other? I don't think it's a pipe dream. You know, I, I don't think it's one of those things, well, that's what heaven's going to be like, but the church today can't be like that. I don't think that God would allow Paul to speak these words to us if it wasn't possible. Right. But it is a lot of hard work. Right. It's a lot of hard work to set aside our own ambitions to set aside our own agendas, to set aside our own desires so that we can focus on a common purpose of winning souls for Christ and being united together in that effort. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3, Paul said, Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. What a powerful statement that is. Right. Make every effort. Are you doing that? In your church, you know, not everybody watching is attending Dayspring, 
you know, in your church, are you making every effort possible to be united in spirit and be bound together in peace with the, those that you go to church with? Yeah. You know, uh, you know, are you making the, are you trying to live in harmony with the people around you? I love the verse that says, you know, uh, that as, as far as it depends on you right. to live in peace with others. Now listen, I can't make everybody live at peace with me, but I can live at peace with them. Right. You know, Peter, in 1 Peter 3, 8, he made this statement. He says, finally, all of you should be of one mind. Mm -hmm. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tenderhearted and keep a humble attitude. Right. Isn't that a powerful statement? Yeah. Over and over and over and over throughout. And it makes you wonder, why did they have to tell us so much? Because they knew we were going to struggle with this. They knew that unity in the body of Christ was going to be difficult. That's why Paul taught about it in every single prison letter. That's why he talked about it in Romans. That's why Peter wrote about it. That's why Jesus talked about it so much. He knew that the dynamic between people was going to be hard and that we needed to learn how to live in unity. Psalm 133, 1 says, How wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. In fact, unity was one of the very last things that Jesus prayed for us. He prayed that him and the Father would be one. He prayed that the disciples would be one. But he prayed that, that us, who are far off, that we would be one as they were one. Right. He was emphasizing the necessity of unity in the body of Christ. Right. So it got me thinking, you know, how many people are failing to come to Christ because of the division and disunity they're finding in our churches? Right. You know, they come in, they're looking for hope. Yeah. They're coming out of broken homes. To come out of a broken home and only to go into a broken church doesn't seem much of a step up. Right. To, to come out of a dysfunctional home and step into a dysfunctional church doesn't seem like they're, they're gaining much right. by coming into the body of Christ. Yeah. You know, how does what is separating us, if we are fighting or we have an argument or a disagreement, how does what is separating us compare to the incomparable riches of knowing Christ? I mean, is it, it probably doesn't amount to a hill of beans. Whatever it is that we're fighting about, whatever it is we're disagreeing about, compared to people's souls being saved, right. it's probably very little at all. It doesn't amount to much. You know, if there was ever a time that our world needs to see a united church, it is right now. If there was ever a time that we needed to focus as one united body on the mission and purpose of evangelism, it's right now. Right. If there's ever a time. You know, and, and something the Lord just laid on my heart this afternoon that was this. The church not being able to meet in a church building should never minimize our effectiveness in reaching the lost. Right. Rather, it should mobilize us. Yeah. It should never minimize us. It should only mobilize us. You know, amazing things are happening right now. I had a meeting with several other pastors, Assembly of God pastors from around the state, and they're telling us about people coming to Christ who've never stepped into a church. People coming to know Jesus who are friends and neighbors. You know, the church not being able to meet in the building is actually open doors for people to come to know Jesus like never before. Amazing things are happening. Here's a statement. Thousands of people are stepping into the kingdom of God that have not yet stepped inside a church door. Let me say that again. Thousands of people are stepping into the kingdom of God that have not yet stepped inside the church door. Here's my thought, all right? Here's my thought regarding this. Perhaps the reason that we're not in the church building right now, that we are not gathered together, and maybe you, this, you could argue this if you want, but here's just my statement. Perhaps God needs to fix some things in the church and in us before he allows these new believers into our church. Yeah. 
Think about that. Maybe the reason that, and I'm not saying that God brought this virus on, but I'm saying that perhaps that, that during this time, God is wanting to work on the church right. and get us healthy so that when we come back together, these new believers, and listen, there are hundreds and hundreds of people coming to Jesus right now. Before they ever step into a church building, that the church itself has gotten itself together. Right. So that they're not coming into a dysfunctional church. You know, why would God want to bring a new believer into a divided, disengaged church that is adrift with no real mission or purpose? Right. You know, I think that's probably what's challenging me more right now. I hear a lot of my pastor friends that are already saying, you know, we cannot go back to church as usual. We cannot go back to the same way that we were doing church before. We have to do things differently. Right. And I think really what the focus is, when I'm listening to the messages that are being preached, and I love it, I listen to three or four or five of my pastor friends preach on a Sunday morning that I never get to hear before. You know, and all of them are preaching Christ and they're preaching salvation and, you know, and they're preaching repentance of sins and they're, they're, they're preaching all of these necessities for coming into the kingdom of God. And what's happening is people are getting saved. Right. And people are coming to Christ. People who never stepped through a church door before. I've got friends and people that are, are on my Facebook feed that they have never been to our church, but they have watched faithfully. To these, to these broadcasts that we've done. Right. That's why we always preach Jesus. That's why we always give people an opportunity to receive Christ. Because people right. are getting saved day after day. Right. And it's like you said, you know, I mean, God certainly didn't cause this to happen. But, you know, God will always, whenever we allow him space to, will always take what the enemy meant for evil and he'll turn it for good if we're open to that. And, you know, now we're having to rethink relationships. You know, we're, we don't have that face-to-face -face like we're used to. You know, it's, and, and oftentimes we rely on church to build relationships with people. We're now, we're now we're having to rethink that. We're having to pick up the phone and call or in, have those conversations with people and have that personal contact. And, you know, God's refining that in us, causing us to really think about other people and to really consider you know, how is, how is this person doing? Is there anything that I can do to help you? We're really stepping outside of our comfort zone to, to be the hands and feet of Jesus and, and to help people that are in need. And things that we wouldn't normally think of on a day-to-day -day basis because we're just doing life. And now we're like, oh, my neighbor across the street, you know, I see that, you know, maybe they've got something going on. Do I need to go help them with something? You know, those are all things that Jesus has called us to do, but the busyness of life kind of push that to the wayside for a lot of people and now God's like you know that everything's been wiped clean so now we're reevaluating all of those things and those are the things that we don't want to go back to normal right yeah you know I just want to make sure that when we go back to doing church in the building that we don't lose the evangelistic momentum right that we are building right now through social media and broadcast and one-on-one -on -one witnessing with people. One of my friends said that he had somebody who was waiting in the parking lot at the church. They weren't having church that day. He just happened to be going by and, and ultimately he, did, he led them to Christ. And you know it was it was out of the blue. It wasn't or it wasn't it was out of the ordinary. Right. And he, but they we're looking for that now. We're looking for opportunities and ways to minister Jesus like we've never done before. And so I just want to encourage you through Paul's prison. Remember, this is a guy that's encouraging unity and encur and encouraging the church to come together and live in harmony. This is the guy who was in prison. Right. This guy was quarantined off by himself, but he's looking at the greater body. And here him in prison is looking at the church in Philippi, and he sees two women who, are, who have a disagreement and realizes the dramatic ramifications it could have if they do not reconcile. 
It right. will hurt the church evangelically. It will hurt the church as far as productivity. And it will, it will cause those who come into the church to question reconciliation. Mm -hmm. So we need to learn how to be reconciled. We need to learn when we have sinned, how to repent. We know we, when somebody has hurt us, we need, to know, we need to learn how to humbly go to them and try to reconcile that situation right. quickly. And, and so that when we get back together as a body and we're worshiping as a whole, that when that happens, that these new believers that are coming to Christ right now are going to step into a healthy church. Right. And that's my great desire. I want us to be, I don't want to have a dysfunctional church. Right. I don't want to have a divided or disengaged church. Right. Amen. So we're going to pray. If you've never, listen, if you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we want to pray with you tonight to receive Christ. Uh, what a great opportunity. There's never been a time in history. The Bible says that today is the day of your salvation. And Jesus is waiting on you. You know, and the, I know that a lot of people like get saved on Christmas and Easter and around those holidays. And maybe you're thinking a little more about Jesus this week as it is Holy Week. And we're moving towards Good Friday. And we're moving towards Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Can I tell you, though, that there's no better day than today? To put your faith in Christ. And so we're going to pray for you. And if you're listening to this. And, and you, you're, you're uh, receiving Jesus for the first time. Or rededicating your life. Would you just put that. Just make a comment. And say I'm coming to Christ. Or I'm rededicating my life. As we pray together. Our Heavenly Father. We thank you so much. For the sacrifice of your son Jesus. We believe that he died on the cross. For our sins. We believe that he was buried in a borrowed grave, and three days later that he was resurrected to eternal life, that we might have eternal life with God in heaven. Father, we ask your blessing today. Help us to live for you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We also want to pray for you tonight uh, for healing in your body. Uh, perhaps you're suffering with the, the COVID-19 uh, virus. Perhaps it's another issue that you're dealing with. But we want to take a minute just to agree together in prayer for your healing. Father, we thank you that Jesus bore the stripes upon his back for our healing. And it's by those stripes that we are healed. We pray for all of those who have been affected by this virus. That God, in Jesus' name, God, that you would show up strong in their hearts and in their lives, God, that, Lord, that you would, you would be the breath in their lungs tonight. And, God, that you would help them to overcome every respiratory issue in Jesus' name. You would cause every infection to cease in the name of Jesus. Lord God, that you would call those who are battling cancer, God, to be able to stand up in Jesus' name and walk in complete wholeness. Those battling heart issues, God, that they would be made whole tonight in the name of Jesus. We thank you, God, that Jesus bore the stripes at the whipping post for our healing. And it's by those wounds that we are healed. Thank you, Jesus, for that. We praise you, Lord. Well, we just want to thank you. Uh, for joining us tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to share God's Word. Can I encourage you that if you don't know where you're going to go uh, as far as uh, a service on Sunday morning, we will have our live feed video at 10 a.m. Uh, that you can come onto our Day Spring page and you can watch with us uh, on YouTube and on Facebook on Sunday morning at 10. But there are also other great churches and things out there that are doing live broadcasts drive in church, all kinds of things happen in this Sunday. You really don't have an excuse not to worship the Lord this week, you know. So plug in. We look forward to seeing you then. God bless you. Good night.